Okay, thanks for the conveners and hello everyone. I'm Sean Tao from David Matavigis Group in Princeton. Today I will talk about uh, diversity of phenology in seasonally dry tropical forests. So we're going to step away from a temperate forest for a while. Um, as a short introduction, seasonally dry tropical forests are uh, closed canopy forests, mainly distributed in subtropical and tropical areas where the rainfall is highly seasonal, as you can see from the trim uh, satellite. And uh, it accounts for over 30, uh, 40 percent of the forest areas in the tropical regions. However, its uh, phenology is under studied partly because uh, all the phenol cameras and flux towers are in Amazon or temperate forests and uh, the remote sensing products are not performing very well because of cl uh, cloud cover. And uh, as early as 1970s, uh, field studies have revealed that there is a whole spectrum of phenology coexist in seasonally dry tropical forests even within one pixel in the modest data. Modest, uh, modest data. Um, so uh, Bouchard and uh, Rivera, they discretized the spectrum and defined four uh, dominating phonological guilds in seasonally dry tropical forest. And uh, here in the figure, black solid curve is a canopy fullness ranging from 0% to 100%. And it should be noted that uh, this uh, figure is uh, only uh, a schematic and uh, not uh, that accurate uh, because we don't, uh, they don't have uh, accurate measurements. And if we look at the dry season, which is bounded by the uh, red bars, you can see different phenology, phenological guilds perform differently in the dry season. For example, the, the succulent deciduous species, um, they have light wood and uh, they have long leafless period. Recent studies also suggest that they are very sensitive to photo period changes and uh, they can have early leaf set, uh, offset uh, when for the period is shorter than 12 hours, even though there is a plenty of water. And they have early leaf onset uh, when uh, photo period is uh, longer than 12 hours, but only extend their leaves when the rainy season starts. So, uh, and then there's another deciduous species with very long leafless period, uh, but they're not sensitive to photo period at all. Uh, here I denote them as D-long. And the uh, third one uh, is also a deciduous uh, uh, species, but they have relatively relatively short uh, leafless period. And finally, there is a more evergreen-like uh, guild. Uh, they have nearly no uh, leafless period, or par only partially uh, drop their leaves in the dry season. So all the all these different phenological guilds coexist in uh, uh, in seasonally dry tropical forests, but they are uh, underrepresented in the in most of vegetation models. So um, this might introduce large biases in uh, model predictions uh, and uh, model uh, predict, predict, uh, predictive skills. So the natural question is how to account for this observed diversity. Uh, in this uh, talk, I, we will propose a more generalizable phenology model framework that can account for the diversity. And we implement the, uh, the model in, uh, ED, uh, in ecosystem demography model version two and we test the model with an extensive data set in, in a tropi seasonally tropical dry uh, forest in Costa Rica. So um, ideally, the phenology model should be generalizable. However, in most phenology model for uh, seasonally dry tropical forests, they only consider environmental variables uh, when predicting phenology due to plant water stress. So diversity in plant functional traits does not play a role in this scheme. What we're pre uh, proposing that uh, we need to consider the differences in plant functional traits. So in our new model framework, uh, plant water stress is determined by plant water supply, plant water demand, and the plant drought resistance. And all these three terms are dependent on both uh, environmental variables and plant functional traits. So in this new model framework, uh, trees can have different plant water stress even though they share in the same environmental conditions. And actually, if we want to make this thing work, we need to cons deal with three major issues. First, um, how do we mechanistically determine plant water stress from environmental conditions and plant functional traits? And we chose leaf water potential as an indicator, uh, as suggested by various uh, field studies and physiological studies. 
And then how to represent plant drought resist resistance, which is not considered, uh, generally not considered before. We use Turgelos point. Turgelos point is the leaf water potential at which the leaf, plant uh, the leaf cell uh, turns from turgy to placid and lose leaf turgor. And few studies have suggested that uh, leaves cannot sustain long if their, uh, if their leaf water potential is lower than uh, turgulos point. And finally, uh, in this model framework, we need to consider uh, plant functional traits and how to infer those plant functional traits that are not measured in the, uh, uh, in the real world. And uh, we resort to trade-off and uh, coordination among plant functional traits. Uh, I will talk a little bit more about trade-off and the coordination here. And trade-off is that plants cannot do multiple things right at the same time due to physical constraint. For example, a well-known example is that species that are, uh, that are efficient in light harvest uh, cannot sustain, uh, cannot tolerate shade very well. And while coordination is that uh, trees, uh, uh, plants tend to develop uh, plant functional coordinated uh, plant functional traits to form a more efficient system. Uh, for example, lots of field studies have shown that uh, several leaf traits are coordinated with stem traits and ab above ground functional traits are coordinated with uh, below ground functional traits. So from numerous uh, field studies and the field data, we found that uh, key plant functional traits related with plant water stress are largely correlated with specific leaf area and with density. I'll show you an example here. So in the key parameter, Turgulos point, uh, we found from a metadata analysis that it's uh, correlated with uh, specific leaf area and with density uh, uh, in seasonally dry tropical forests across the world uh, because there is a trade-off between drought tolerance and resource acquisition. And we implemented this new model framework uh, within uh, ED2 model. And the uh, ED2 model uh, tracks individuals of different size and age classes and uh, resorbs the radiative transfer within the canopy explicitly. And uh, we add a new plant hydraulic module and new phenol phenology module uh, and couple the two modules with the, the existing ED2 model. So leaf water potential is mechanistically predicted at sub-daily scale in the plant hydraulic module. And then the leaf water potential will influence the photosynthet photosynthetic capacity. And uh, also, we uh, specify that when leaf water, a pre dorn leaf water potential is lower than turgulos point for 10 consecutive days, then the plant will, uh, then the trees will start to shed leaves. Next, we test the new model with uh, extensive data set in uh, Costa Rica, in Palo Verde, Costa Rica. And uh, here in the left panel shows the observed specific leaf area with density and leaf habit in, uh, in the site. Each dot represents one species and area uh, repre uh, represents the relative abundance. And we can see here that species with similar plant functional traits, they have similar leaf habits, which is in, uh, uh, which, which is in accordance with our series. Um, so to test the model, we calculate the average plant functional traits for each uh, phenological guild. And we fit in the observed plant functional traits and uh, observed meteorological forcing into the updated model and check whether the model can reproduce the observed phenology and other key, plant, uh, key vegetation dynamics. Uh, so first I'll show you the, uh, the phenology predicted by the model. In the left panel, it shows the uh, predicted uh, seasonal, uh, seasonality of canopy uh, in tropical dry forest um, and uh, uh, averaged from 2009 to 2013 and the shading area represents interannual variations. So we can see that uh, it has a pretty good match with the uh, observed patterns. Uh, succulent species, they have early uh, offset because of the photo period control and they have long live list period and they have early uh, onset uh, because of the period. And then uh, there are two, like the two deciduous species, they nearly shed all their leaves in the dry season, and the long have uh, longer uh, low leaf cover days than the short. And for evergreen, they only shed part of, part of it, their leaves in the dry season. Um, we also compared the leaf phenology at ecosystem level. 
And so in this panel, we compare the leaf area index predicted by the model in the black curve and compared it with the Q-band microwave data, which is believed to be a good indicator of canopy biomass and is uh, not very sensitive to cloud cover. So uh, we can say that uh, the uh, model predictions in remote sensing data um, match pretty well in, the, in terms of uh, the onset and offset of the uh, uh, canopy, uh, canopy leaves. So uh, do you, we, all, we further compared our model predictions of monthly leaf litter uh, with uh, observed data. Um, so in the upper panel, uh, the red curve is the observations, monthly uh, leaf litter observations in the field. Um, and the uh, black curve is the uh, simulated uh, monthly leaf litter. And we can see they have a pretty good match. Uh, the leaf litter peaks in the middle of the dry season uh, when there's no rain and the VPD is high. And it should be noted that this uh, shelter before the peak is due to the photoperiod control. If we don't include that, then the simulation can't match the observation very well in these regions. Um, then finally, we want to push ourselves a little bit further. We want to check whether with this new phenology scheme, whether we can reproduce the observed interannual variations in biomass growth. So in the left panel, it's the biomass growth normalized by basal area to eliminate the size effect for different uh, phenological guilds. And uh, we can see generally uh, the, the model did a pretty, uh, reasonably good job. However, it underestimates the growth at the higher end. And uh, in addition, the model perform, per performance varies between, uh, among phenological uh, guilds. To further illustrate that, we calculate the wet season, uh, the wet year growth over the dry year growth. So if the ratio is one, that means the phen uh, that uh, phenological guild grows same in the wet years and dry years. Uh, in the figure, you can see that all the three deciduous species, they grow better in the wet years in the observation, which is captured by the model. However, the model underestimates the ratio for D long and D short because, it, uh, as I said in that panel, it underestimates the growth in the higher, at the higher end. And uh, in the observation, the evergreen guild, um, they grow better in drier years. Um, and, but in the model, it's, uh, the growth is not sensitive to uh, annual uh, 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 changes of uh, uh, precipitation at all. So uh, a short summary. We propose and test a more generalizable and a mechanistic phenology model for seasonally dry tropical forests. So we start from the physio at the physiological level. We, uh, we, and, uh, in the model, diversity in plant functional traits lead to different plant water stress, and which will produce distinctive leaf phenology. However, um, the updated model uh, can only explain some degree of interannual variations in vegetation growth. Uh, that means we're still missing something. Uh, possible candidates are like, uh, for example, seasonal variation of leaf photosynthetic capacity. A lot of people are talking about that today. And uh, due to, for example, VC max can change due to leaf aging or photo period. And also, we don't have a really good control on below ground functional traits and processes because it's really hard to measure that. And, not many people are doing that. And so all these stuff, uh, well, all these signs show, uh, call for more species level observational studies and integrate all these information into the model world. And uh, as for the future directions, uh, we only test this uh, new model within one site uh, in Costa Rica. If it's a truly generalizable model, uh, it should work in other sites and even other biomes, and it can explain the spatial patterns. So we're, we're like, we would like to test the model in other uh, places. And if the model works uh, pretty good, uh, it would be very interesting to test the long-term changes and feedbacks under uh, climate changes when accounting for the diversity in the phenology. Because uh, species with different phenology, they have different sensitivities to climate change, and possibly they have different feedbacks. So uh, I'll stop here. I want to thank uh, Princeton Environmental Institute for their uh, funding, and uh, I want to thank our collaborators and lab mates for their discussions. Thank you.